The mayhem at the Mandalay Bay ended only when Stephen Paddock killed himself just before the police breached the door of his hotel room. We have actually sound of that happening. Here it is. And on the suspect's door. I need everybody in that hallway to be aware of it and get back. We need to pop this and see if we get any type of response from this guy to see if he's in here or if he's actually moved out somewhere else. Got me audience on the 32nd floor. SWAT has explosive breach. Everyone in the hallway needs to move back. All units move back. Breach, breach, breach. <laughs> There it is. One of the things that jumped out at everyone who listened to the audio of this attack last night uh, was that it sounded like automatic weapons fire, which is unusual uh, in this country. What exactly was this man wielding when he killed so many? Dr. Michael Bodden is a forensic pathologist and expert on bullet trajectories. Chris Korolnik is a former Marine and active shooter expert, and they both join us tonight. Chris, first to you. Um, there's, there's usually a lot of focus on the firearms, which you know may or may not be that relevant. But in this case, it maybe is relevant because it did sound like automatic weapons fire. Was it? And if so, what does that mean exactly? Well, you can tell by the rate of fire. And good evening, Tucker. I'm sorry to be with you tonight for this reason, but um, the rate of fire is what we call cyclic rate, which is it's firing as fast as the gun's capable of firing. Yes. And to get it to do that is either it's a functionally automatic weapon from a manufacturer, which means while you hold down the trigger, it will continue to fire until it runs out of ammunition, or as you feed it, or it's a semi-automatic, and as fast as you can pull the trigger, rounds will go out. This seems to be a fully automatic sound from the background, whether it's 223 or 308 rounds, and right. we know from the uh, undersheriff that he did confirm those rounds were found in those rifles. However. Um, you can make these kits and you can get them and convert them on your own. So it's not uh, too far off per se, but the deterrent to do it is horrible. Uh, the ATF has got a very strong hold on this. Oh, yeah, yeah, and these you can't firearms, do that. Right. But, well, but what well, levels? The, the misnomer is they're, they are legal if you purchase them with a stamp. Right. No, I, I, I know that. But wh what I don't understand is how hard is it? My understanding was you had to be a, a relatively talented gunsmith to do that, but you don't? No, sir. I'm not going to tell you how on TV, but you can basically change a couple pieces within the mechanism of near the trigger and turn it a semi-automatic weapon into a fully automatic weapon. You get in a lot of trouble for that. I guess this guy, of course, uh, didn't care. Um, didn't so, care. Doctor, doctor, what are um, pathologists learning as they examine uh, the victims of this tragedy today? What will they be looking well, for? Well, one of the things that the uh, coroner's office pathologists will do is uh, remove as many bullets as they can for the police, and the police will go around to the uh, coroner's office and to each of the hospitals to get every bullet that's removed from every patient, and they will then be able to find out from which weapons uh, the bullets came from and this is to ensure that there wasn't a second shooter with another gun that wasn't present at the scene. Right. Some, an issue that comes up will, will come up sometime. But the most important thing they're doing right now is to deal with the families who are at the office and they want the, to know who's dead and they want to get their uh, loved one back. And the identification of the bodies is the uh, first uh, procedure that goes on in the uh, coroner's office. Right, of course it is. I, I wish we had more time. We're bumping up against a hard break, unfortunately. Michael and Chris, thank you both very much. Thank you. Tucker. Thank you, Tucker.